Welcome everyone to the Adversity to Advantage podcast. I am very excited because I know this man for quite a while. Uh, we've got David Allard with us on the podcast, a special season all about mental health at work. Uh, we've known each other for ages. David is uh, retired now, but has a wealth of experience as CEO of uh, Financial Life Management, uh, a financial services organization. Welcome to the show, David. Thank you very much, Petra. Nice to see you. It's nice to see you. I mean, we see a lot of each other, but it's good to have you uh, so that we can pick your brain and get some of your thoughts and wisdom on the topic specifically of mental health at work. Uh, but before we do that, I'd love to just ask you a couple questions that we ask everyone to uh, so think about it. Uh, question one, what's been the best piece of advice you've gotten about work or your career? Can you remember a single piece of advice that has been profound or stuck with you throughout the years? I think, um, yeah, a couple of bits that I was told once, um, always be punctual, always be polite, and always do what you say you're going to do and be consistent about it. And there's those sort of four things that actually, if you stick to those rules, you can't go too far wrong, can you? I love those because they're pretty simple, but it shows some consistency of character if you have those things. Yeah, I think with, with all rules, you've got to check in every now and again and you know, it's great having great ideas or rules or whatever, but adhering to them is is another thing. But I think it's like anything, if you ingrain it deep enough, that becomes part of your personal culture. And hopefully you can then take that on to others that, that feel how you do. That's what I was wondering. Did you end up looking for those qualities in people that you hired or in people that worked for you? Well, I had a strange approach to hiring people, which is... A lot of the people we recruited, I recruited personally, and I met them socially through one medium or another. And my rule was never let a good person slip through your hands. So if you spotted somebody that was really good news, then recruit them and then worry about what you're actually going to get them to do. Um, I know it sounds strange. And at times we had sort of two or three people in HR saying to me, what am I supposed to do with these people? Um, but somehow we muddled through and it always worked. And um, yeah, I've, I've, I've made a lot of friends in business. Um, I actually had a phone call yesterday out of the blue from somebody I hadn't seen for four years, just saying, Judge has called to say thank you for everything you did over the years. So, you know, nice. If you, you, getting people to engage, you've got to get people that feel how you do and have the same values and want to achieve the same things. I think putting square pegs in round holes is, uh, is a no-no in business. Yes, we we do, we, we do, and I'm, as you know, facing some of those challenges with building our, our own culture as well. And that is jumping ahead to like what's important about culture, isn't it? Um, but one more question. Uh, was there anything that you've had to unlearn in order to get better at work? Did you have some habits or things that you would do and then you had to learn over the years that, um, oh, actually, I've got to unlearn this because it's not um, evolving maybe with the way work is going? Yeah, I think the, um, you know, I grew up in an all-boys school in Australia and then an all-boys rugby playing school in England. And it's not surprising I'm a sort of man-up type of person. So about five or six years ago, we did a really good exercise called Insights, which is all about psychometric testing. And actually, you, you fill out a questionnaire and you have your character effectively played back to you. I got two things out of that. Firstly how accurate it was. It was just amazing, uh, a machine effectively telling me the person I was. But secondly, you realise that actually you're very different to an awful lot of other people because there's no point just looking at your profile. You've got to look at the profiles of other people. And if there's something I had to unlearn, it was the route one communication, uh, sort of the footballing equivalent of Wimbledon, you know, point it up the wing and hope for the best. And get the whole team engaged and communicate in a way that was appropriate for the person I had in front of me. So how did, if that's not that many years ago, so you did a, a good portion of your career sort of thinking, well, communication in one way uh, sort of works. How did it change the team dynamic to have done that assessment together? Yeah, I think really, really good. Again, it's, it's a percentage thing. Some people will get very excited on the occasion and then within 10 minutes they've forgotten all about it. Other people get excited, engaged, want to make changes. And you know, you sadly get some people that just don't buy into it 
at all, really. But I think that bit's a minority that everybody, uh, virtually everybody, really got a lot out of it. But it's just taking that forward. And it's, it's like those mantras we talked about a minute ago. It's just repeating until it's ingrained and you think about it. But to me, it's such an obvious thing because you could see how people appreciated that different approach of communication to what I would have given them historically and how well they reacted to that. So, uh, what, I was, what was the historical way? Well, just, you know, hard graft, get on with it and everything will be fine. Sort of hard work and, and, and a, um, just can do attitude will solve everything, but life's not quite that simple, is it? So it got a little bit more complex or um, nuanced. So you're actually the only CEO or ex-CEO that we've got in this season. Uh, so we're really curious. We've got loads of people from like human resources, diversity and inclusion, learning and development. And we really thought it would be valuable to just get the insight from that leader from the top uh, as far as what's changed over the years when it comes to people, teams, and this topic about mental health. What have you noticed? I think if I look at it from a personal view of my own experience with the business, that understanding the people really, really help with productivity. I mean, what, one of the things I'm absolutely convinced about, if you've got a good person that's motivated in an organisation, they're about three and a half times more productive than somebody that just happens to be there and doesn't really buy the culture and whatever. So anything you can do to bridge that gap has got to be really good news for the business. Um, what I've learned moving out of wealth management, which is a very different field to mental health in theory, but you know, both are about communication and feelings with investments. And very, very interesting because, for example, the psychology on an investment is somebody's four times as worried about losing money as they are motivated to make money. So again, starting to understand that psychology is very helpful when you want to reassure people. But Getting involved with your business and the work that we're doing, the thing that I've learned is there's an awful lot of old school, you know, rip it up and, and drive forward type of leaders in, in organisations that don't quite get that we're in a new world where people need a bit more. And particularly the millennials, that generation, I'm not into labelling people, but younger people seem to be more a lot more open about their mental health than expect to work in an environment where where that's prevalent. So yeah, they're, they're more open about it, but there's also uh, ideas around the snowflake generation and entitlement and that uh, the younger generation don't wanna work as hard. Do you think that's true as well? Or is it just people putting labels on a generation because they're different? I, th I think it's, there's a bit of both. If I look at the people we recruited, and by the time I left, I think I had 10 or 11 of my friends, sons and daughters working, working in our business, including one of my own. Um, and these kids were real grafters. They were a pleasure to, to work with. They were totally honest, um, punctual, you know, well turned out, they had pride in their work. You could, you know, the, the, the ultimate test of somebody is if you give them some work and you know it's done to a good standard, that's the sort of person you want to work with. But on the flip side, I do see outside of that environment, um, yeah, there is this entitlement, but, you know, um, probably my generation as parents caused the problem in the first place. You keep telling your kid they're amazing and they can have everything they want in an instant. Well, you know, is it any great surprise that, that they grew up with a feeling of entitlement and, and that things should happen yesterday. Patience is, is something you learn, but if you, if you don't have to be patient during your childhood, why should you grow up as a patient person? Yeah, and these days you can just shop, everything's on your device, everything's on your phone, you can just access anything you want so quickly that it takes away some of the kind of need for patience. But you must see the need for patience within the financial wealth industry where people need to think about waiting for their investments and it's a, it's a different lesson there, isn't it? Yeah, again, you get that spectrum of people, which is why it's important to understand the person you've got in front of you. I mean, the first question I ever asked when I met somebody is, how do you like to be communicated with? Because until I know, well, as soon as I know that, I know a lot more about the person. But if you've got somebody who has had a bad experience or knows somebody's had a bad experience with pretty much everybody, 
um, have seen market corrections or credit crises or whatever, and they're sensitive to those, they're going to need a lot more time and reassurance than perhaps your classic chief exec who is saying, right, give me a page, make sure you write down everything you, you expect me to do on a page of A4, and then I'll give you my answer. And it's a very different approach. But um, I, I certainly know through the work that I did with St. James's Place, and you know, they're the biggest wealth manager in the UK, that they're doing a lot more work on communication with clients, understanding clients, understanding the psychology of investing. So I'm guessing that uh, they've made the right decisions and it's a, an important part of work. I mean, it is quite a fast paced industry though. And you talk about historically that kind of man up culture of, of get on with it, the British culture as well of stiff upper lip, upper lip and just keep moving forward. What about if somebody does have uh, depression or anxiety or any of those sorts of things as an employee? What do you think people should, employers, CEOs, leaders should be doing to support those people? Or is it kind of like some people just don't fit in certain industries? Well, I think first you've got to know. I think the stat is something like 50% of people suffer in silence so if you don't know. And, um, you know, it's interesting because I watched, um, it, was a, it was a thing that you did on um, National Suicide Prevention Day um, and people talking about the fact that actually nobody knew how deep they were in their hole um, because the facade was up. So I think open communication, firstly having a culture where mental health is discussed openly and as a culture of it's okay to talk about mental health issues, you know, grazing your knee is no different to grazing your brain. And, you know, that's the way I look at issues. Something's, something's happened that, that's triggered something unpleasant. Um, so I think checking in with your, your employees on a regular basis um, have somebody who's intuitive and can do that because, again, often the approach to mental health is having people who aren't really good at picking up the signs doing that kind of work. But I think you've got to start at the top. Uh, um, I would encourage all people in a position of power in a business to get their story out there. Everybody's got a story of some kind or other. Um, be open and honest about it, which we encourage other people to be open and honest engage i think once the problem's identified for me i'm too new in mental health to you know offer advice but but what i feel is there's got to be some kind of plan for recovery i think without a plan you know if you had a bad rugby injury henry slade broke his leg back badly playing for exeter i'm sure there was some kind of recovery plan physiotherapy treatment etc etc and I think the same is true of any mental health issue. Have a plan and then at least you can feel that the downward spiral has been leveled out and you can now move into an upward spiral. But I think it's important that the employer and the employee collaborate together on that plan. And then once that plan is successful, make sure the next plan is about resilience because there's no point in you know, creating a good situation only to see it fall apart again. Absolutely. And then from your perspective as CEO, when you were uh, at FLM, like whose role do you think it is to be checking up on people or being ha having those intuitive conversations? Because you get to a point as CEO where you become too busy uh, uh, with, you know, with high stakes things, with strategy, all the rest of it, to perhaps be connecting with everyone. You know, who, who are the roles that can encourage that? Yeah, I mean, I always... I tried, but ultimately failed for the reasons you've just stated. But there was nothing more enjoyable than hopping around desks, you know, 8, 8 30 in the morning and just talking to people about how the week's going or how their life's going, or, you know, and you pick up so much. So, somebody who's good with people, a good communicator to do that, starting at the top, as high up the company as possible and working, working down. So, the chief executive to do it, or where it's not possible, somebody working on the chief executives behalf to do that same thing but I think colleagues should check in on colleagues and ultimately you know line managers are called line managers for a reason and um, there should be that line of communication between them and every, everybody they manage again I think those people need to be trained to look out for the signs they need to be trained 
to deal with it. If you've got somebody that's not going to spot the signs and isn't very good at talking to people about awkward situations, well, that, that's a failure from the start. And again, I haven't been doing this too long, but I think I've picked up a reasonable amount. I think there's an awful lot of people offering roles like mental health first aider or, or mental health champion, and actually they're not really suited to that role. Don't get me wrong, I know a stack of, you know, I've met a stack of really good people. But again, even when you've got really good people, we have to make sure those people are supported um, and that other people's problems aren't just being piled up on top of them and that the training is ongoing. You know, if somebody hasn't been trained for a year, they've missed six or seven months of coronavirus. And from what I gather, our house arrest has just been extended for a further six months. So it's a very, very fast evolving, different world we live in now, or in general, but certainly compared to a year ago. Yeah, and I'm just jumping ahead because I want to ask you about, about the future of, of work, but um, just the, the image of you as a CEO sort of walking the floor and just it was, it was sort of simple in a sense to just go, all right, I'm just going to walk the floor, ask people about their weekends, check in in a, in a calm sort of preventative, let me get to know my people and, and, and stay um, present with them. But we just can't do that anymore for many of us. So it's, it's yeah. this remote working, isn't it? It's this um, checking in by phone or individually or team meetings. And I know you're not, um, you, you, you join us for our team meetings and we're working together as you're on our advisory board. Um, but do you have any thoughts there? Like how do you replicate that, that sort of floor walk um, remotely? Yeah, it's very difficult because it's going to be far more time consuming. Um, but uh, it, it, it's still got to be done. So, you know, somebody, uh, but there's a number of different ways you do it. I personally, I would form support groups um, and get everybody together once a week for half an hour. It doesn't take from day and actually talk about anything but work, talk about what's going on outside of work. But you can, you know, a, a really good pair of questions I used to ask is what's going, what's going well at the moment, what's not going quite so well. And, shut up and um, it's very easy to talk too much but great to have people listen and in fact to a degree i did do that because when i didn't have time to go and talk to everybody for 10 minutes because that would be more than the day gone i would arrange a lunch every month and pick five or six people one from each department in the company uh, and go and have a lunch there's no reason you can't do that over zoom and you know you could actually talk about what you're eating and why you've chosen that or all cook the same thing. That would be an interesting challenge. Um, you know, so many recipe boxes out there that you could have delivered. You know, they cost like four or five pounds to do that with 10 people and invest 50 pounds of the company's money. It's not a big spend. And if you've all prepared the same meal in advance and you're sitting there, you know, you make it a bit of a competition. But anything that introduces fun and the two words you've taught me is humor and lightness and that those sort of things that take away this constant stacking of pressure events challenges to do's onto people's shoulders in their own home there's like this heaviness isn't there this this sort of doom and gloom and yes there is there is some of that but it feels like it's extending into the workplace and and people are almost forgetting how to just have fun. So those were great ideas. And I also love your questions, which are so simple, but they're a step further than how are you? I'm fine. Uh, because it's more specific. It's going, what's going well, which gives people space to celebrate the wins and to talk yeah. about good stuff. So it isn't just doom and gloom, but also what's the tough bit? What's the challenge you're facing? Gives people space to go, oh, let me think about that and let me communicate. So, so you get something more specific within those questions. Yeah, spot on. And, you know, they're questions that kind of invite an answer. I mean, it would yeah. be strange not to get an answer. And actually, if you don't get an answer, somebody's giving you a bit of an answer, aren't they? Um, so just to carry on from that, I'm curious about the, that just that amount, the amount of time that it takes for you as a CEO to check in with people in that way. And do you think the managers that are tasked to support people, do they need to adjust their workload a little bit in order to create space for those types of conversations? Like, how do they hold both in mind their deadlines and the work that they have to do and investing in their people effectively? 
Well, I think the starting point is look at the cost of not doing it. So what does mental, what do mental health issues cost your business? You know, I've only been in this six months, but I've forgotten how many meetings I've attended with decision makers. Not one person had even the faintest clue what mental health issues would cost in their business. So until you understand that, how do you know what the problem is and how much resource you want to put into it? Knowing the figures, um, you know, it's an awful lot of money and productivity for the business if you look at it commercially, but it's also a lot of unnecessary angst and unpleasantness, quite frankly, that's existing amongst the workforce. And if, if you think about it, your biggest asset, your people, so many times over the years, people have said to me, oh, yes, it costs this to replace somebody. And I think you aren't even close to the figure. They're looking at the cost of recruitment consultants or whatever. You know, it probably takes six months for a good person to embed themselves in a role and be productive. Well, that's six months worth of cost and everything else that goes along. So I think... Leaders of businesses have got to understand the problem and then they've got to say, okay, what are the solutions and what do they cost? And quite frankly, I think they need to outsource a lot of these issues because generally mental health is being dealt with by people who've got full-time, fully loaded jobs and they're being given the the mental health side of things as an add-on. They have no idea really of what they should be doing, what the strategy is. Then they find out what the strategy is, they kind of panic, and am I using resources in the right way because I've only got a limited amount of resource? And then they look at the workload that's going to come from that, and actually you're taking someone that's trying to solve mental health issues and you're putting them in a position where they're stressed to hell. Well, that's a bit of, bit of an irony right there. Um, we see it, it all the time, don't we? Exactly yeah. that, people overwhelmed, or they're volunteering because they're passionate about it, or they're part of the people or HR teams. But we've even seen businesses where they're, they don't hold that title, but they're passionate about it, but it's well beyond the scope of, of their work. So there just isn't time. So there is something about bringing an expert in, get a strategy in place, and roll something out that's sustainable rather than I've got a bit of time and then or I've, 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 somebody's telling me to do something. Get, and, and we see it all the time, people getting overwhelmed and stressed themselves and their own mental health being affected. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I was always brought up to, to abhor waste. Um, you know, we just didn't waste anything in my family. And I think I've probably introduced that concept to my children. But as, as a CEO, that's a good thing. And if you have a financial controller that feels the same, you're even better. But there's, there's waste in terms of the problem and there's obviously waste in terms of wasted resource that follows with the problem but you know just to give me an example there was a company where um they had 18 people on their mental health um, committee who would all meet together now that's great to have 18 people throughout the company and you've got 18 advocates etc etc but i worked out because of the people involved they're reasonably senior it was costing them four thousand pounds an hour just to have a meeting. And if they're five of those a year, there's 20,000 pounds worth of resource. They, they're no further progressed than where they were before. And that resource could have been used to pay someone to put the strategy in place and then manage all the workload and organization and it's done professionally. It, it's just, it's amazing. But I think in fairness, it's a new subject. It's only been really in topic for the last two or three years. And an awful lot of people don't know where to go. But my, my, my advice was start by getting some help on the strategy and looking at what you want, what, what's wrong, what you've done about it, what, what your ideal looks like and what's the plan for that going forward. It's no different to the recovery plan for the individual. And compare the bottom line. That's what I'm hearing you say is not yeah. best because there is a bottom line. You are spending money on crisis. Uh, and if you kind of look at it from that perspective, then you're investing in your people um, more effectively. Um, you, you touch on uh, growing up and um, not, not learning not to waste and that sort of thing. I'm curious about the mental health topic uh, just in general. How has it um, uh, affected you or why have you become interested in it over the last few years? Uh oh. <laughs> um, well, actually, for, for me, it goes back to um, I, I got divorced about 21 years ago, and prior to the divorce, went through some marriage guidance counselling, and 
But what I learned about myself through that process was just incredible. You talked earlier about advice you've been given that changed life. I read a book called Feel the Fear But Do It Anyway. And what a fantastic book that is. What I realized is the sort of three levels of fear, but the, the real core fear that everybody has is if such and such happens, I wouldn't be able to cope. And I recognize two things. One is everybody feels like that. So actually I'm no different. And once you realize that your fears are no different to anybody else's, you can actually rise up above the crowd um, and not worry so much. Um, and secondly, guess what? As humans, pretty much always we do cope. Um, we say, well, I, I wouldn't be able to cope. And then that's exactly what we do do. Humans are very resilient, which is why there's so many of us. Absolutely. Uh, and I know we've started uh, conversations back when you were still uh, CEO. How long have you been retired now? 10 months, but who's counting? Well, it's been an interesting 10 months, hasn't it? For yeah. personally, but then you've had a global pandemic thrown in at the same time. Um, yeah. You see your, uh, you've got daughters, they're, grow they're adults now, young adults, yeah? Um, yeah? Do you see something different in the generation or what they're expecting as far as mental health support? Yes, and I think, you know, my three daughters have been part of my education because I was convinced I would breed a rugby team and live happily ever after. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, they still could be a rugby team or part of one, but uh, have chosen not to be. Um, you know, I think having daughters has definitely taken some of the uh, hard edges off. You can't run around H&M, you know, putting clothes back on rails and getting new ones in different sizes and running to change rooms and, and still <laughs> think that, you know, you're, you're some tough guy. Um, but definitely the, the approaches and the conversations I have with my daughters are so much more open, um, revealing about me and about them uh, than I ever had with my parents. And I regard myself as having a, a terrific upbringing. I had great parents, um, but it was just different times. And I, I do think that probably I did live with a lot more pain than my daughters do that my parents didn't know about. I'm not saying I had it any harder or easier, but... I think I understand where my daughters are coming from a lot more than perhaps I, I was able to communicate with my parents. I know you have daughters, but do you think there's still a pressure on, on men, I guess, young men to, to show no weakness, to man up, to, to maybe stay a little bit more closed off than for women? Right. Well, I've got some strong views on this. I, I, I think for young guys, it, it's a pretty tough place to be because, you know, you're constantly, yeah, there is the man up bit. There's, there's also, you know, how you treat a female. You, what one man can, what one youth, let's say, can say one thing to one girl and that's perfectly acceptable, but to another girl it's not acceptable. Um, I think this sort of politically correct world that we live in is probably having more of an impact on young men than young ladies in my experience. I'm three daughters and, you know, they've got boyfriends and, and whatever. But... Um, I think it's, it's a tough world for all of them. Our generation, um, pretty liberal. Um, most things went, um, we, we, uh, I don't know how to say it. We, we just got on with life and swept stuff under the carpet. I think that has repercussions. I think for um, my daughter's generation, the stuff that, comes out at them all the time. I, I don't think social media is great. I listen to the news and I think, wow, you know, this is really seriously negative stuff every day. And it's also very divisive. And I don't remember growing up in that kind of divisive environment. One minute it's poor students and then it's poor this and poor that. And it's sort of trying to isolate people. It almost feels like people are trying to is isolate groups. The media are trying to isolate groups away from authority, government, local authority, or, or the police, whatever you call it. Absolutely. I just saw this um, documentary on Netflix. I think it's called The Social Dilemma, um, talking about how social media, really the back end, the dark 
bit of it is influencing that polarization. And we're seeing it a lot with the COVID-19, uh, the, the, the pandemic and how it's communicated and all the noise. There's so much noise, isn't there? And we feel like we've got to be connected to it all the time. But the friction between people, whether they think it's a conspiracy theory versus being really anxious and scared versus the whole continuum in the middle, it's really causing uh, some conflict. I don't know if you're, are you seeing any of that? Uh, for sure. And I think, I think also it, it, it evaporates people's self-humor because everybody's being told they're entitled they should be respected and everybody's got a view, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, I, you know, I was taught that you've got to earn respect and that you've, you, to be entitled to something, you've got to do something, you know, there's that, that graft and reward equation. And, and I think that's very hard. I, I do believe that self-humour will help every recovery plan in mental health. But generally in life, if you've got the ability to laugh at yourself, not take yourself too seriously, it's self-deprecation actually is quite a good form of humour and it's, it's quite charming. Um, so that would be my advice to younger people. But again, it's, been, it's hard when they were lauded by their parents and you can be anything you want to be and you're amazing, darling, to then go into work environment and find actually just the same as everybody else and they're not going to become chief executive in the next 12 months and there's a long hard road ahead uh, again it's a lack of preparation isn't it yeah i love how how well you've attached and so many people do to the lightness and humor angle of of the work that we do because i just really think we this is a time where we need hope we need to find the lightness and the um kind of the hilariousness of the human condition you know through the ups and downs um of life uh, so, I, so I love that we're aligned on that. Um, you're recently retired, you said 10 months. And for many people, especially uh, looking at somebody who's had the career span of yours, loads of excitement, you've built your business up from the ground. What was it like just for your mental health to, to, to let go and to transition and to develop a different um, kind of lifestyle? Was there any impact there for you or fears, I guess? They were, they were a lot less than I expected them to be, and certainly, oh, a lot fewer, I should say. The, the, the fears were a lot fewer and further between than I thought, but certainly um, in, in respect to what other people would have thought they'd be. And I think it's, it's the same thing where I've had to show resilience in life. I have this sort of attitude of bring it on. So I wasn't dreading retirement. I was saying bring it forward and embracing it. And also... I think everybody needs a purpose in life. You know, as cave people, our purpose was to go out and forage, find food or hunt or whatever. And you did that and you came back and you felt fulfilled. Whereas today, you know, it's, it has everybody got a job that wants a job or whatever? So you've got to go and get that fulfillment. If you retire, I've got to have a purpose somewhere else. Um, and so all I did is... I looked at my life and I thought, what have I been neglecting? What needs dealing with? And effectively, all I did was recreate a new to-do list in different areas. Um, and, and it's all worked. It's all worked really well. I'm, I'm loving the two days a week that I do with you guys. I'm playing plenty of golf. I had a meet-up with a couple of mates down in the Cotswolds, people I've known for 40 years this weekend. Um, on, a, on a lad's golf weekend, this weekend coming. You know, life's pretty good. I feel like you're almost busier what, between your DIY and your golf and working with us. You definitely put in more hours than uh, the, the, the two days sometimes. Uh, you have a full and rich life. Is that fair? Yeah. And again, there's times when I definitely do do a bit too much generally. But, you know, you can sleep. You can sleep when you're dead, can't you? For, for now, I just I think there's so many good aspects to life. I did a bit of work with a, with a charity and... Um, I've had a couple of really good donations through some, some approaches that I made last week. And it's just uplifting. You know, there's the hard work element, but it's like running a marathon. It doesn't matter how much training you've put in or how much it hurts as you go around. As soon as you cross the finishing line, it's worth it. And just to keep having finishing lines to cross, um, you know, I, I think it's a very healthy existence. But to keep, for some people, keep that's, having a goal. Mm. Yeah, I was going to say it's a lot hard for everybody, but there's all sorts of things you can do. I, I joined a, a lake swimming club a couple of weeks ago, and you can go and swim around a lake. It was exhausting, 
but really good fun. And uh, again, once you've done your, your laps of the lake and you get out, it doesn't matter how tired you are, you've got a real buzz that those endorphins that flow around you. Um, terrific. A lot better than dopamine, I find. A lot better than dopamine. Have you f- found it? I don't know if you have friends or colleagues that have uh, retired as well. Have you found that, uh, that experiences can be different where, where people maybe lose that sense of purpose and it can affect their mental health? Yeah, I, I don't think there's any question that um, some people have had a less enjoyable and a, and a different experience. But, um, you know, I, I play golf a lot and there's a hardcore um, group of the over 50s. And we talk an awful lot. There is a very open conversation um, that goes on on a regular basis. I think, I think golfers, by definition, have to have self humor because it's a game that goes wrong all the time. Well, not all the time, but a lot of the time, a lot more than I'd like. Um, and if you don't have that self humor, you're flinging clubs and whatever, but people around you will self correct that approach and sort of say, come on, mate. So you have that self humor. I think people talk more. But yeah, I've encouraged people I know to perhaps do a bit more, try some new things. Um, during lockdown, we had a chili growing competition. So um, Who won well, in the end? Well, we had two categories. I'm pleased to say that I won the jalapeno uh, and uh, my good friend at the golf club, Simeon, won the cayenne peppers. Um, unfortunately, last place, blokes being blokes, last place had to um, eat the cayenne pepper. But it turns out that he deliberately lost, I think, because he loves, he's got a, a certain talent for eating extremely hot chilies. <laughs> so he was fine. Maybe he lost on purpose. Um, it, yeah, it all worked out well. It all worked out in the end. You obviously have the gift of time and a little bit of space and choice at the moment. So you're able to do these sorts of things that are good for your mental health. Um, I'm curious about at the height of the busyness and intensity of your, your life as a CEO and building your business, when you just had to be on and all the time and support people, hire people, the, the, all the rest of it. Um, did you still prioritize time for fun, exercise, looking after yourself, or did the balance get a little bit um, skewed? No, I mean, with the exception of, of one year, which was just a stranger, because I was captain of the golf club, I, I was sort of grounded in the UK, but I used to um, take three months off as holiday every single year. Now, that was just my way of doing things. So I would work flat out for six weeks um, and then I would go on a holiday for a week, 10 days, maximum of two weeks, come back, recharge, and then get into it again. Um, and the other discipline that I always had was physical exercise. I would always exercise at least five times a week. So, you know, a significant dot walk, a run, a gym session, um, game of golf. Um, and you've got to de-stress. I was listening to something you did the other day, and it was talking about a wild animal that's been chased and the antelope and its adrenaline going and going back to the herd and shaking it all out and getting rid of that stress that it had just gone through and then relaxing and moving on. And I think that's what physical exercise does. Yeah, I watch people who just don't exercise physically. They don't shake it off. And they're just adding layer and layer and layer of stress in their lives. Um, for, for me, exercise is a fantastic stress release. I agree. I found that I have to do more high intensity kind of exercise during this time. Whereas before you could do a bit of yoga and go for that walk. And now I'm like, I need to punch something um, it's like kickboxing or something like that. Cause it's like, there's, there's just more adrenaline uh, buildup. Um, so finally, I just want to future focus a little bit more. We talked about, you know, the CEO kind of uh, walk being a little bit different and you had some great suggestions about um, sort of teams just talking about anything but work or, you know, what do you see in the future uh, with all this remote working, with all this pandemic? And I know there's loads of hypotheses about what the future of work is going to look like. Have you got any, any thoughts there? Do you think we're going to go back to normal or that things will forever be changed? Well, I think generally we do revert back to the normal, don't we? But um, I, think, I think there's an awful lot of positives that have come out of lockdown. I've certainly got a lot of positive out of lockdown. And you talk to other people, they have as well. And there's a lot of negatives also. So it's, it's creating that nice blend, the, the compromise. Um, you know, I would hope that people use their time more wisely because if you've got to go back to commuting, you're going to inject two hours 
of stuff into your day that you didn't have before. Actually, another great tip somebody gave me years ago is put stuff in your diary. If you put something in your diary, there's a 90% chance it'll happen. And if you don't, there's a 10% chance that it'll happen. Um, so, you know, if you've got a 90% chance of something not happening because it's not in your diary, well, um, there was a certain logic. So, so schedule in the fun and the, the, the downtime, exactly is that what you're saying right. as well? Right. Yeah. I, well, I, <laughs> I still think people working from home, you know, I'm amazed how many people aren't taking holidays because, oh, I don't want to go away, I'll have to quarantine or it's risky or, you know, the, the negative stuff's come in. Um, and they're not taking holidays at all. They're not even taking days off. And they're working longer hours, you know, on their own. Now, none of those things are healthy in my mind. So, you know, people have got to look at their diary. I'd be doing it now. I'd be saying, right, between now and the end of the year, let's practice it. We've got three months left, practice it. And then also in my diary, write what I want to do for next year, but actually do it from two points of view. Let's assume COVID is continuing and let's assume it's not. So if it's not, I'm going to Puglia in Italy to go olive tasting for a week in March. But if I can't, then what I'm going to do is a cookery course in the Cotswolds or you know, whatever I'm allowed to do. So have, have alternatives because it's very easy to go or oh, not doing that and then you move back into work mode back into piling on the stress um, it's like people are in limbo cool. they're like <gasps> waiting for you know somebody to tell them what the next bit of their life's going to look like so i love that actually of like all right we'll I have two uh sort of plans of, of what that could look like and um make some conscious choices about uh, you know how you spend your time yeah and i think there's also I think that it's important to be reliable in, in life and to do what you say you're going to do, which is what I said right at the start. For example, I've got a friend who he's organised um, a golf month in Spain for his 60th. So he's hired a veteran. He's asked people to come and join him for four or five days. Now, I know I'm going to have to go through quarantine. People can tell me I'm irresponsible or whatever. But I've said to him that I will go and as long as I can hop on a plane, go and see him, and I'll wear my mask, I'll be sensible, and I'll come home and I'll do my quarantine. But perhaps you're not solid, just go and face your quarantine. It's not the end of the world, is it? Two weeks at your own home. Uh, load your home with, I don't know, order a Cadbury's hamper or something for when you get back. And <laughs> you've got something to look forward to. Life, you know, you can, you can make life a bit of fun. Humour and lightness. Humour and lightness. And I'm feeling like just continue to live you know, in, in retirement, during COVID, whatever, keep living. But um, I'm curious about this because I'm a new CEO in my sort of growing business. And obviously you've been doing it a, a lot longer. And there is this kind of pressure to keep upbeat, hopeful, happy, uh, this, you know, kind of have this air like everything's okay and everything's going to be okay. But do you think there were, or in your experience, is there ever scope for a leader to, to have a bad day or to not always have the pressure of being the upbeat one who's, you know, making sure everyone thinks everything's going to be okay. I can only speak for, for me because everybody feels differently. Um, I, the one thing I fail to integrate and convince people to do uh, in my old business, and I used to, well, I'll explain, Get, get up in the morning and choose your mood. Look in the mirror and choose your mood before you go to work. Now, I remember telling my kids this on the way to school when they were about, I don't know, seven, nine, and 11 or something. And they had Daddy, you don't be ridiculous. How do we pick our mood on the way to school? Because we don't know what's going to happen. I said, that's the point. You need to decide what your day is going to be like, not people around you. And it's amazing if you decide to be upbeat or you, know, you can pick moods like, I'm going to be ridiculously positive or, or um, I'm going to be as cheeky as you like today. And you stick to that mood. Actually, once you mentally got into that frame of mind, you're absolutely fine. You can take it forward. So I used to say to people, right, send an email around or go around the floors. I want your moods. I want them on a poster, on your computer screen uh, and work towards it. But again, it can only work if you want to do it. If somebody's saying, you've got to pick a mood and you're just putting something on your computer to get me off your back, um, that's not going to work. But to answer your question, you know, I made mistakes. I got things wrong. Um, I probably was too hard on some people at times and not hard enough. And, you know, you just, you're going to make mistakes. 
or you know I might be moody one day or that's fine the following day stick your hands up and say do you know I felt like I was a bit moody yesterday I'm sorry for that and uh, I'll try harder going forward and no one is going to criticize you for that so can you have a weak moment yes but can you do things to not artificially but to train your brain to be upbeat yeah of course you can life's life's it's a lot more pleasant, a lot more fun if you can pick a zany mood for the day and stick to it, no matter what happens. That's, I love, that's uh, yeah. yeah, and I, that is resilience. And I love how long before you knew the phrase of mental health or more about mental illness, uh, you were doing some of these mindset tricks for yourself to pick who you wanted to be, what your mood was going to be, and showing up in the world that way. But also I love the authenticity of going, hey, hands up, messed up. Let's start again. Tomorrow's another day. Let's get started. Um, and I guess it's got to be authentic for people. So if somebody is, de- is suffering from depression or anxiety, you know, it doesn't have to be, I'm going to be the most cheerful person in the world, but I'm going to show up or I'm going to be pleasant or I'm going to do something that's going to be fun, whatever that might be. So it's like whatever your step is, take that step. Um, David Allard. It's been a privilege to have you in my life in general. And I'm so excited that you've been part of the PVL uh, business. Your advice is uh, so perfect for for me and what I need. And what I love about you is your curiosity, that even though you're at retirement age and you're at a different phase, you could just be like, I know stuff, I'm good. I don't need to learn anything else. But you've totally stuck into the mental health topic and admitted that you didn't know some things and have been learning the whole way. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Well, thank you for those kind words, Petra. May I echo them back to you? You're you're a good sort. (laughs) Thank you, thank you.